So I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to talk about our ongoing work in uh, developing cell therapy for age-related macular degeneration. And I'm going to talk about in the next 30 minutes uh, on the work we're doing for IND enabling studies uh, to file the phase one IND application, hopefully by the end of this year. So just to give you an overview of the disease we're talking about, because I don't think most of you spend your time thinking about what age-related macular degeneration is, this is a disease that affects the central vision of a patient. And uh, oops, sorry, turned it off. Okay. So uh, this is how most of us see, but this is how patients with macular degeneration see. They have everywhere in the room they're going to look, the central part of their vision, they're going to be blind. And since this disease affects uh, mostly elderly people and worldwide, there were 30 million people affected by AMD. So, and unfortunately, until now, there's no treatment for this disease. So the economic burden of this on our society is huge, and it's a big unmet medical need. So the way this disease happens is it's a disease that affects the back of the eye, the retina, and the photoreceptors. So this is uh, how a normal eye looks like. This is the retina. And these are the photosensitive cells, the photoreceptors that allow most of us to see. And in this case, the photoreceptor cells die, and as a result, the patients go blind. But the reason photoreceptor cells die is because of this tissue called the retinal pigment epithelium, or the RPE. So it's a monolayer of pigmented epithelial cells that spend their life taking care of photoreceptors, uh, maintaining their function and health throughout their life. And they have this, these are very polarized cells. They have tight junctions between neighboring cells. They also form the uh, blood retina barrier to the eye. And they have these apical structures called apical processes that are really the business end of these cells. And they are in hand to glove relationship with the photoreceptor hour segments and allow, uh, and that's how kind of these cells work helping the photoreceptors maintain their health and integrity. So what happens in the AMD is that these photoreceptors, these pigment epithelium cells die off. And as a result, the photoreceptors on top of them die because they don't get functional support from the pigment epithelium anymore. But interestingly, uh, at the, the way disease progresses is that this would be the area where the patients are really blind. This is the center part of their eye. And this is towards the periphery. This is the relatively healthy part of the eye. In between these two areas, there's this zone called the transition zone. And in this case, what's happening is, as you notice, the pigment epithelium is gone. But the photoreceptors are still hanging in there. And these photoreceptors are destined to die. They're not functional anymore. But in the next few months of patient's life, they're going to die off. But what the idea is that if you were to transplant an RPE implant in this transition zone, it could protect those overlying photoreceptors and at least stop the vision from getting worse in those patients. And in fact, this procedure has been clinically tried a number of times. What, uh, what clinicians have done is if you think about this is the whole eye, and this is the central part. They cut out the RPE from the same patient's eye, from the periphery, move it in the center, and leave it there. That's a complicated procedure, often fails, and it's a very long surgery. But in a small number of cases where this procedure succeeded, patient's vision was restored and, and stayed stable for many years to come. So that provided kind of for me the proof of principle that if you can develop an autologous RPE patch, for AMD patients and deliver it the right place, you could actually protect their vision from declining. And that is the guiding principle for the work we're doing at the NEI, where the goal is to start with AMD patients, somatic tissue, uh, blood cells specifically in this case, reprogram those cells into iPS cells, differentiate them into an RPE monolayer patch, the, like I showed you with polarized uh, epithelium, and then deliver that patch back to the patients as an autologous cell therapy. So in this video, I'm going to show you a 4 by 2 millimeter patch, and you can see pigmented cells on top because these cells are pigmented. The back of the patch is not pigmented. It's a biodegradable patch, and the surgeon's assistant is manipulating it before the surgery, so it shows you the patch has enough physical strength to maneuver around. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you all the preclinical work we have done in terms of manufacturing this patch under GMP and testing it in animal models for safety and efficacy. So as many of you might be familiar, uh, IND application has three main components, uh, chemistry, manufacturing, and contents uh, control, CMC, where you actually provide all the description of how you manufacture your pro uh, test article, your product. And then the preclinical data, where you, talk, uh, where you look at the tumorigenicity, toxicity of your product, and efficacy. 
And finally, how are you going to implant that uh, in patients, so clinical data, uh, patient uh, uh, exclusion and inc inclusion criteria. So I'm going to walk you through all these various parameters. So the process of making this RPE cells from iPS cells, it's a long process. So if you start with iPS cells that you already have, um, from that to getting mature cells, it's about 10 weeks of uh, time. But we've spent quite some time optimizing this process, and you know, it's, it's a, an important point is that we, we made sure that the process is developmentally guided. So what that means is that we add the right growth factors in the right combinations at the right time, so the cells would go through the natural stages of development all the way to mature RP as it would happen in an embryo, but it's happening in a dish. And at the end of this 10-week period, we get pure RPE cells in addition. You can see because these cells are pigmented, you can just visually uh, recognize them. And then by flow sorting we can, or flow assets, we can tell also that we can get easily pure cells uh, from IPS cells. The process is highly reproducible. We've done it now over one and a half dozen different IPS cell lines. I'm just showing you four examples here. IPS cells made from uh, either healthy fibroblasts or healthy blood cells or iPS cells made from two different AMD patient fibroblasts. In every single case, we can get IP, uh, RP cells at a very, very high efficiency. So then once we have the RP cells available, uh, pure RP cells, we put them on a biodegradable scaffold because we want to deliver RP cells as a patch, so as a perfectly polarized monolayer delivery to the back of the eye. And the choice of scaffold for us is uh, PLGA, polylactic glycolic acid, with its uh, uh, electrospun nanofibers, and which are fused to provide this physical strength that we need for the patch to survive the delivery procedure. So we grow cells on the patch for about four to five weeks, and they can easily form a perfect, nice monolayer on top. And in this case, we are looking at these cells by two different markers. RP65 is an enzyme that only is present in mature RP cells, and you can see they all are highly mature on this uh, scaffold. And then collagen 4, which is on the basal side, shows you also that the cells are highly polarized. So again, the scaffold allows us to make really perfect monolayer, highly polarized, and mature cells on top of it. Just another example of the, of the scaffold, and now in this case, this is a scanning EM that has been pseudocolored to show you the scaffold cells and their apical structures. Remember the business end of the cells in three different colors. So in blue, you have the scaffold, and since you're looking at it from an edge, you only see three cells here, which are colored here in brown, and then you look at those apical structures in green. And you can clearly tell that all the, the, all the cells are very homogeneous, they look similar to each other, and they're highly polarized because they all have those apical structures. So the scaffold, of course, also maintains the uh, purity of the cells. If you look at a number of different markers, in this case, two different purity markers and, and cells made from two different donors, we can get almost 100% pure cells. And if you look at the maturity markers, again, two different markers, we get cells that are very, very mature, more than 80 90% maturity in the entire monolayer of the cells. So now the problem is that when you're developing an autologous cell therapy, um, the cells are going to be different. You know, you make cells from person A and person B, you're going to get different results. So how do you qualify that the cells that you made from person A and B and C, they all are really RPE cells? You know, do you have to have a parameter, a range of assays within which your cells can be qualified as RPE cells? So we looked at that very carefully, and we realized that there are mainly two sources of variation, and one is, of course, the genetic differences between all of us, and the second would be technical differences. So the iPSC clones, as we all know, are slightly different from each other, and all the technicalities that go into making iPS cells and making pigment epithelium, there are some technical variations in the whole process. So then, really, to validate the cells that we get at the end to say, look, this test article is functionally validated, now you can go transplant in somebody's eyes, we went through a series of assays to qualify the cells, including several uh, molecular assays, looking at purity of cells, gene expression, the shape analysis, and then several functional assays, including the resistance of the cells, because these are, as I said, epithelial cells. They have tight junctions between neighboring cells, and if you pass, if you put electrodes, one on top and one on bottom, pass current, they would show resistance to the pass of current, and that can be measured as transepithelial resistance, so resistance of several home, uh, ohms per square centimeter is really a parameter for true functionality of these cells. And then going on to looking at other, other functions like polarized secretion of cytokines, 
and their ability to phagocytose uh, our segments. So we ran all these cells that we made through with the, uh, all these assays and really came up with a range of assays, range of results for all of these assays in which we want to qualify our cells. And then, oh, sorry, so go back. And we did it across uh, three different AMD donors and in each case, three clones per donor. So we had nine different clones, so nine different articles to work with. And the interesting thing is that there's a lot of variation in, in the results that you get from all these different assays. Although all of them qualify within the range we specified for the results we wanted, but they were still variable. And we, we were not able to really pinpoint what, what is causing more variation. Is the genetic differences causing more variation or the technical differences causing more variation? So what we did is, instead of looking at variation of individual assay, we kind of clumped them all together into a principal component analysis. And, and drew them on a, on a principal component axis. So it went across five principal components. Now this is the data of all the six different assays into one graph for all the nine clones. So you can imagine how much data went into making this one graph. And what you notice first thing is that most of the clones out of these here are on the principal component one axis. So they're variable, but they're still close enough. There's one clone that goes off to different principal components. So it's clearly much more variable than other clones. So that really stood out. And we were really happy about this, that now we actually we thought we had a way of picking the bad clones that we don't want to transplant. We didn't know what the reason for this variability was, but at least we were happy about this, that we have a way of qualifying the cells. And we say, okay, these are all qualified. This one is discarded. So as we kept on doing more analysis of these cells, and we looked at uh, sequences of the cells. So as you know, uh, many of you have uh, seen the recent uh, news about that there might be sequence variation in the cells or, or mutations acquired during the reprogramming or passaging step. So because of all of those concerns, we exome sequenced all the oncogenes um, in our iPSC clones. And the, this chart shows you is how similar they are to the, to the parent clone. So what it means is, so if you look at donor four here, there are three clones and then there's PBMC which is the primary material from the patient itself. And the way to read it is, the lighter the blue color is, the more similar they are to each other. The more darker the color is, the further away they are, they are to each other. So of course, donor four, C would be identical to itself because it's the same sequence, but also it's identical to the other clones and to its primary material. So donor four had no mutations, no changes, none of the clones, all the clones were identical. Donor three had the same thing, all the clones were identical to itself and to the patient's primary material. Whereas donor two, remember the clone B, which was outside in our PC analysis, the same clone does not match either with other clones or with the primary material of its patient. When we looked closely, this clone had acquired about 600 different either point mutations or copy number variations during the reprogramming process. So it's n equal one. We don't know if this is a, just a coincidence or if this is really a cause that this clone showed so much variation, but at least we're happy that by these two mechanisms, we're able to, to get, combining them, we were able to validate the good clones from bad clones and move forward with the right clones for cell therapy. So that's, uh, and then, but we realize also that, you know, this kind of analysis is, is complicated, and if you have to go towards a commercial development therapy, and you have to make it for thousands of people. You cannot be doing all these assays all the time, and you cannot be doing PCA analysis all the time. So we need a simpler assay, something that makes it much simpler to analyze and say, yes, a good clone, yes, a bad clone. So what we did is we went, into, we went to use uh, artificial intelligence and use what is called convolutional neural networks. So to do that, so first of all, what is CNN? What is convolutional neural networks? So this is a process in which you can feed the computer any input, and so in the left corner here, this describes the input. In our case, we fed it the input of how these cells grow in the culture, so RP images, so images of cells growing in culture. And mind it, we fed literally hundreds of images, so taken, Im images taken every week of the entire world were fed to the computer. And then we fed just one functional parameter, the trans epithelial resistance. And we said, and then the next step in it is uh, how does the computer make associations? So we let the computer make all kind of random associations between those images and a functional parameter, and that depends on what, how strong is your coding, so what, how good your people are who are writing the CNN coding. So hopefully the people we had were good enough, and the output we're asking for is how good these cells are. So we did that. We fed our images 
and the functional data as input, write, wrote the code, and just asked how good the cells are. So the graph on the right shows you the results of the CNN uh, predictions. So on the, on the, on the x-axis is actually the measured, physically experimentally measured, the resist, measured resistance of the cells, whereas on the y-axis is the predicted resistance of the cells. Just uh, to simplify the, the results, I'm just showing you three different uh, conditions, what we call good RPE, bad RPE, or ugly, so red, green, or blue in this case. And the threshold we set for good is 400 ohms per square centimeter. And first thing that you notice that the predicted, the computer predicted results were almost linear with the measured results. They were, they were almost identical, which was really, really relieving for us that yes, the computer can actually also predict good RP just by looking at an image of the cells. <clears throat> but one thing that you also notice is that actually, in, at least in one case, the computer was better than the measured result. So the measured result was, there was one category where it went into false negative, but computer didn't have any false positives. So we think this is still at the early phases of CNN. Right now we have fed the data from just one donor. We are now in the process of, of feeding this data about 12, across 12 different donors. And we hope that by doing that, we'll have such a robust network of uh, a neural network that by looking at uh, RP images, computer will be able to tell us how good our cells are. And that would make the whole process of manufacturing much simpler to be able to identify the right uh, test article for transplantation. <coughs> so now the whole process, we took the manufacturing process and optimized into, into a GMP setting. And this whole, this just one slide took almost two years uh, really mapping out every day of the manufacturing from day zero all the way to uh, five and a half months that it takes for the GMP manufacturing of these cells, starting with the blood draw, isolating of uh, CD34 positive cells, reprogramming them to iPS cells, making a working bank of iPS cells which gets validated for sterility karyotyping, plasmid loss, uh, identity to the donor, and the exome sequencing for the oncogenes. And then going on to differentiating these cells, uh, iPS cells into RPE, and seeding them onto the scaffold all the way to getting the mature product. So it takes really five and a half, half to six months, but luckily we have been able to uh, really pay, uh, map out the process and chart out every single day of this step from, uh, from day zero to the six months of the process. And also we have been able to put aside uh, intermediate step where we can actually cryopreserve preserve the tissue so that if the process fails, you can go back to one of these intermediate steps and start from that rather than going back to the patient. So with that uh, data on CMC, I want to move on to show you some of the uh, preclinical data in animal models. So in the first example, I'll show you some of the toxicity and biodistribution studies we have been doing in, in rat model. So one concern you have, everybody has when you're working with pluripotent stem cells is that what if there are some pluripotent stem cells left in your final product? Are they going to lead to a tumor or a teratoma formation or a, a different lineage formation? How do you prove that? So we did that multiple ways. One way is that we did what we call in vitro spiking studies. So what we did is we, we, we seed the cells on a scaffold for maturity, as I showed you. Before we seed these RPE cells on the scaffold, we mixed them with various concentration of, of iPS cells. And we took about 1% iPS cells, 100% iPS cells, 10% uh, iPS cells, or 100% iPS cells. So we took those mixtures and we seeded them onto the scaffolds. And we asked, how do iPS cells survive on these scaffolds? And of course, on day zero, we looked at two different markers for iPS cells. On day zero, we detect what we put in. But very quickly, within about two to seven days, iPS cells actually die off, and by in about two weeks, we don't detect any single iPS cells on the scaffold. And that's not a surprise, because the scaffold conditions and the culture medium that we use for maturation of RP is not conducive for iPS cell growth. So that's the argument that we use that in our final product, there is no way that any iPS cell can survive. And then even if they did, so we are still doing animal studies to prove that these cells, when injected into immunocompromised animals, do not lead to any tumor or teratoma formation. And as an example, as a positive control, if you inject pure iPS cells in immunocompromised rats, you get this massive teratomas uh, in the back of the eye, so huge that it can actually push the lens out and you can see, identify all the different germ layers. But if you inject RPE cells, and in this case for tumor genesis study, because our human dose is about 100,000 cells, we injected the entire 100,000 human dose in these rats, 
And you can see most of the cells just sit in the subretinal space. They don't do anything. They, they don't proliferate. And they don't really integrate into the back of the eye. Every once in a while, we see a couple of cells that have integrated into the rad RPE. We don't know how it happens, but we notice that every once in a while. But instead of this cell suspension, when we transplant a patch of RPE, a much smaller than what the human dose. So in human doses, four by two millimeter patch. For rat, our dose would be half a millimeter diameter patch. If we do that small patch, interestingly, the entire patch integrated into the back of the rat eye. Again, I don't have any explanation why this happened. The rad RPE should have been here, but somehow the rad RPE died, and the human RPE just integrated into the back of the eye. At least the good thing is that the cells did not proliferate, do not lead to any tumor or teratoma formation. This was done for about a 10-week uh, study, and now uh, we're in the process of doing this for nine months as part of the GLP studies. And the other thing, um, that you would notice is that the scaffold, which should have been underneath these human cells, has degraded by now, and that's the purpose, that it's a biodegradable scaffold. Once you put the cells, the patch, in the eye, the scaffold degrades, and the patch, the cells, cell monolayer, integrates into the back of the eye. So we are really able to demonstrate that uh, in this animal model. So moving on to uh, a slightly different animal model where we want to actually look at the efficacy of this patch because we want to see whether this RPE patch is able to rescue the photoreceptors as it should, as we hope it should in AMD patients. So for that, uh, we used, uh, first of all, we had to develop a tool that would deliver this patch uh, in the back of the eye. So this is um, a, a tool that we developed, which has a tip that has a curve that fits the curvature of the back of the eye, and you can see a patch into the tip. And we designed it such that the surgeon is able to see the patch while he's taking, he or she is taking it into the back. And then the way it is, is the whole tool is controlled by hydraulics through an instrument, and the surgeon can regulate the movement of the patch just by a foot paddle. So only the surgeon itself can able, is able to uh, deliver it, doesn't need a surgeon's assistant in this case. So once this was optimized, we, we went on to an animal model where we could test the human size patch, the four by two millimeter patch that we want to transplant in, in patients. So the, the animal model of choice were, for us was pig, and the reason is that the pig eye size and eye anatomy is very similar to human eye size and eye anatomy, so we thought we could not only test the entire patch, we could test the tool, and we could, we could optimize the surgical procedure that how we want to deliver it in patients. So I'm gonna, so this movie shows you, uh, the eye has been prepped, the movie shows you the surgeon has the, the implant going in, and here, can, can we play the movie again, please? Thank you. So as you can see, the eye has already been prepped. The surgeon is making the incision bigger so he can put the tool uh, inside. And here's the retina that has been lifted. This is a cut in the retina. This is the tip of the tool. This is a patch. And it's just aligning the patch, the tip to the, uh, to the cut, and then delivers the patch uh, under the retina. So the advantage of working in the eye is that you can visualize, non-invasively visualize over this kind of surgical procedure that you're doing. We don't need uh, much of the radio label in this case, fortunately. Um, so his uh, surgery done, and the procedure this is by which we're visualizing the eye is called optical coherence tomography. It's a reflective technique, so you just shine the light, and whatever bounces back tells you how, how the retina looks like. So in this case, we're just testing empty scaffold and to, to test if the scaffold itself is toxic to the eye or not. And this is the retina. You can see different layers of the retina. This would be the photoreceptor layer, and right under that is the scaffold that was transplanted, and, and two weeks later, we visualized it. And you can see from two weeks to six weeks, the scaffold has significantly degraded because that's how it should be. It's a degradable patch, and you don't see, notice any inflammation around uh, the retina in the transplanted area, and these animals were not given any immunosuppression, so if there was any inflammation, it should have popped up. And the best uh, way to look at if the scaffold had any toxicity to, to the back of the eye is by looking at the function of the retina. So we use a technique called multifocal ERG, where we shine multiple light pulses to the back of the eye, and depending on where the signal hits, 
we get electrical response from that area of the eye. And if you get, if you do that on a healthy eye, we of course, of course this is normalized to a healthy eye. If you do that on an eye that was implanted, two weeks after the implant, we see a drop in signal because the, ret <coughs> excuse me, the retina is still healing. But by the time the scaffold starts to degrade, the electrical response of the retina, the electrical signal from the retina starts to come back, suggesting that the retina is healing and the implant did not cause any long-term toxicity to the back of the eye. <clears throat> so then to test the efficacy of the product, we use a model uh, for multifocal, uh, we, we, we use a model where we laser ablate the RPE. So remember I told you that in AMD patients, it's the RPE that dies off. So in pigs, we don't have a genetic model for AMD. So what we do is we'll use a micropulse laser that kills RPE cells, and as a result, photoreceptors will die. But before the photoreceptors die, we put the implant and ask if our human implant is able to rescue the pig photoreceptors. So this is how it looks like in the pig eye. With infrared imaging, we can see the window defect we created. We laser kill the RP cells so the light now goes through. And, <clears throat> and by histology, we can see that the RP cells clump up. And as a result, the photoreceptors are dying. But the idea would be to put the implant here and rescue these photoreceptors from dying. So we do that, and now we can see the implant here. This is now the implant containing the cells, and actually you can see the shine layer, shiny layer of cells on top of the implant by OCT. And now if you look at the multifocal signal, so again, this, this technique allows us to look at the different areas of the eye as, uh, differently. For instance, if we just look at the healthy area of the eye that got the implant, we get this robust response. If we look at the area of the eye that, got, uh, that was lasered but no implant was delivered, we don't get any response, but we look at the area where we laser injured the eye but deliver the human implant, we get a response that is in between, suggesting that these human cells are able to rescue the pig uh, retina. By histology, we can see that the cells have integrated. So in, in red here is a signal that uh, also looks for pig RPE and human RPE, but in green is a stain that only looks for the human RPE. And you can see the human RPE really uh, in, in fact, nicely starts making contacts with the pig RP and nicely integrates into the back of the, of the pig eye. So that's where we are uh, with this experiment, uh, with this project. Uh, we are in, almost in the, towards the end of our GLP studies for, for safety and efficacy, and hopefully we'll be writing our IND soon to be submitted by the end of this year. With that, I want to thank the entire team. You can imagine a project of this magnitude is not possible to be done by a handful of people. So we had to uh, use expertise from people with uh, developmental biology, stem cell biology experience, bioengineering, uh, animal specialists, and, and surgeons, and, and I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to work with a wonderful team. Happy to take questions. Now this, uh, 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 the presentation is open to uh, the questions, please. Oh, sorry, great talk. So the amount of time that it takes to culture the cells, um, I, you're getting our uh, photoreceptor death. Is there anything that you could do to kind of mitigate the death while you're growing these cells, or could you somehow have RPE cells patched and ready to go? That way when patients come with, uh, with uh, clinical symptoms, the patch is already ready to go? So if I understand you more, think about like an off-the-shelf kind of therapy. So, you know, for AMD is, is actually quite a slow progressing disease. So, you know, once a patient is, is diagnosed, they have at least a couple of years before the retina gets to the condition where they need a transplant. So we think that they, we can get to a point that once a patient is diagnosed and, and the surgeon or the clinician knows that this patient is gonna get blind, they would be put on, a, on this pipeline for therapy. And since we'll, what we can do is we can have these cells ready to a, almost at the end stage and make the patch when it, there's a need to transplant. So that's, what, that's the first approach. But then there are uh, groups that are working on actually developing, as you heard from, uh, from the first speaker, the universal donor iPS cell lines and HLA homozygous iPS cell lines. So where you can have banks of iPS cell lines pre-made and ready, so then what, when the patient comes in, you screen them and say, oh yeah, this patient matches this bank. So then you quickly make RP cells for that particular patient from that bank and deliver it back to the patient. So both approaches are possible, and I, my, my feeling is that going forward, we will be perhaps using both approaches together. 
Yes. A very nice talk as usual. Okay. So two questions. So do you do um, a quality control test after make a patch of RP? The second question is how long does it take to um, biodegrade a scaffold in the in the subretina space? So in the subretina space, it takes about um, eight of eight to ten weeks to completely degrade. But in in about six weeks after transplantation, we see there's only a couple of micrometer of the scaffold left. But if you say like there's no trace of PLG, <coughs> excuse me, PLG left. That takes about eight to 10 weeks. Now the first question, uh, I showed you those six assays that we run. Those are all quality control assays. So we go from gene expression, uh, purity gene expression for RPE, gene expression for IPS markers, uh, shape matrix, secretion of cytokines, phagocytosis. So we, we actually run uh, a battery of different assays to quality control over RP patch. After make a patch. Yes, yes, yes. And, and would those six assays be considered your potency testing as well besides QC? So at this stage, we're using them all, and we hope to pick a couple as potency tests as we have to go forward. And perhaps, you know, if the, if the CNNs work, the neural networks work, perhaps that could become a potency assay as, as a much more robust readout of, uh, of the quality of cells. Okay. And for the top spam testing, in, because I think it's kind of really important data to, to kind of understand what is ne needed in your top spam package. So growing the human cells on the patch and doing it in rat and a pig model with immune suppression, same regimen as you would do in the humans, is, is that what is required by the FDA? No, so the pig data is, is not for tox. Pig study is mostly for efficacy. Because for toxicity, because you know, you have to do you know both genders and enough animals and different time points that you can draw some statistical conclusions. If we did that for pigs, I think we'll be bankrupt. <laughs> um, so the pig study is much smaller. The rat study, so all the toxicology and tumor genesis is being done in rats, and there we have done um, four different time points: two weeks, thirteen, twenty-six, and thirty-nine weeks both uh, genders and, uh, and then cell suspension and a patch. So in total, we have injected or transplanted about 450 rats. Yes, thank you. <laughs> That's a big study. <clears throat> wonderful work, wonderful talk. I uh, wanted to pee my pants when I saw your uh, scanning electron micrograms. The, uh, you showed us for obvious reasons uh, the quality control and the characterization of the of the donor uh, of the cells from donors with disease. Have you had the opportunity to look at the variation in cells from healthy cadaveric donors, and how does it vary more or less than those from people with disease? So yes, the answer simply answer is yes, we have, and they are also equally variable. We actually published that data um, last year. Um, so that, that, that was a basis for making ranges of different assays, and then we tested the patient uh, after that. So there's a similar variation in just all of us, if we made cells from all of us, yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.